Okay. Thomas, you ready? Let me know when you are good. <laughs> you good? All right, excellent, perfect. Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Tonight's Tuesday, December 5th. We're located at the, doc at the Dr. William Arnone School in the theater, it being 7.13. And I will open this meeting and respectfully ask everybody to stand and salute our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I'd also like to take a moment and read into the record that in addition to attending our meeting in person, the public can view this meeting by way of television on Comcast channels 98 or an HD version in 1071 and also online by way of the link www.youtube slash the Brockton channels. My name is Kathy Ehlers and I'm the vice chair conducting the meeting tonight. Unfortunately, our mayor can't join us but has a family event this evening. And I'd like to open up this meeting using a roll call vote to establish a quorum. Ms. Sullivan? Here. Mr. Homer? Here. Ms. Rivas Mendez? Here. Mr. Rodriguez? Here. Mr. Sullivan? Here. The mayor is absent, and I'm the vice chair. I'm here as well, so we've established a quorum. Um, at this time, we do not, for number two, we do not have any hearing of visitors here tonight. And so I'll move right on to number three, which is the report of superintendent of schools. So Dr. Cobbs, the floor is yours. Good evening, uh, Ms. Ehlers. Um, so we're gonna start off the evening with the uh, student representative report from uh, Anthony Vega. Hey, I hope everyone's having a good day. Um, I'm here to report what's going on the, the, for the day-to-day -day events at Brock and I. Uh, to start it out a while ago, I'm going to be talking about the Thanksgiving Day football game. Uh, BHS lost a hard-fought game against Bridgewater Raynham to end off the season. Both the students and the staff of BHS are appreciative for all the players and coaching staff that, uh, that took part in the season, and we look forward to the bright future ahead. And then a special congratulations to the standout senior Cam Montero for his commitment to the University of Pittsburgh where he'll continue to showcase his outstanding athletic talents and all of Brockton High wishes him luck in his collegiate career at Pitt. <laughs> uh, next up is the cross country team. Uh, they got an all expenses sponsorship by Nike to go to Nike's Northeast Regional Championship they selected only Brockton to attend free of charge, as well as receiving new uniforms and sneakers from Nike. Um, Coach Cliff Canavan, who's been with the team for uh, 20 years, inspired Nike to offer this, um, this honor to the team because it's his last year coaching the team. He's retiring this year. Um, so congratulations to the entire team on receiving this huge honor. And Brockton High wishes Coach Canavan well on his last year of coaching. Uh, next up is the, B the Brockton High Drama Club, which, who is very excited to present their hard work and their newest performance, Parlor Games, an incredibly amusing, funny, and entertaining experience with a phenomenal cast. Uh, so I advise everyone to come see their hard work on December 8th and 9th at 7.30 and uh, December 10th at 6 o'clock in the Brockton High Little Theater. Uh, I know like a lot of the cast members and everyone that participated in the show, and they always do a fantastic job with every one of their performances. So I'm not just saying this just to advertise it. Anybody that saw Mamma Mia last year, they know the talent that comes out of Brockton High, so for sure. Exactly, yeah. It's unbeatable. Uh, and then uh, our pep rally band got to showcase what it really was to, to have Boxer Pride, as they were reached out to by the Brockton Pro Probation Court to be a part of the National Adoption Day. Not only did they play the national anthem, but stayed during the adoption ceremony and played a small concert at the end. And because of their great performance, which is, which is usual for them, they were also invited back to perform next year. Nice, that's awesome. Cool. And then, for, uh, as far as the student feedback, of course, um, with uh, new Principal Duarte's new policies and such, there's not gonna be any dramatic impact immediately. However, this doesn't mean that the improvements aren't working. 
for instance, one of the strong differences I see is the list of absent teachers is getting incrementally lesser and lesser. Yes, exactly. Okay, um, over the past week or however long it's been, um, which affects how many kids are wandering and how many kids are sitting in the cafeteria. Of course, there's still progress to, meet, uh, to be made. It takes time to mm -hmm. um, refurbish like the new policies and all that. But I do see that the improvements to the school are trending in a positive direction. Um, little by little. I also want to, I didn't write it in the PowerPoint. It, uh, this came to me after I wrote it. Um, we need to still establish, excuse me, establish a uh, still more accountability. That's my number one word. Mm -hmm. I repeat it like every meeting um, for just those kids because all the opportunities given at Brockton High, it's amazing what kids are able to do and able to uh, learn. And there's, there's that small percentage that just don't care and they keep disturbing the piece, of, uh, disturbing everyone else's learning environment. And that's really what's bringing down our school's reputation and everything else. So mm -hmm. I think we need to um, just act maybe a little, I don't want to say harsher, but slightly more act differently. That's, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, towards that small percentage of people that just can't uh, stick to the rules. And I think we'd see a lot of better improvements throughout the school. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I always appreciate your version of what's happening. No, seriously, a student's version of what's happening at the high school, because I know how we're looking at it, and I know how we're addressing it. But to hear it from you, and and I want to. Um, I want to express to you that being authentic and transparent is the most important way you can present to us. So don't sugarcoat like we want to know what's going on like from your viewpoint. Mm -hmm. But to hear you say even there's been a small change and we've moved the needle just a little bit in terms of absenteeism with the teachers, that's huge because mm -hmm. that's just the first step. So thank you. Especially as a student, the perspective of that one word that you use, of accountability, I think that just speaks volumes and is so important to, like, just accountability in every aspect, right? What you were referring to at Brockton High School, but just across the district, especially us. Um, so just thank you for being accountable, being here today as well. Yeah. Okay, moving on. Okay, moving on. We'll have the uh, EDI recognition of student ambassadors uh, with, with Donnell Williams to present. Or is Renee going to present now? Good evening, everyone. I am very honored to be here today, especially for the occasion, um, to recognize these student ambassadors behind me. Um, so I'm going to first read aloud what they have been presented. So it says, congratulations, certificate of recognition presented by the Brockton School Committee and the Brockton Public Schools. And then it says, for demonstrating exceptional leadership as a student ambassador and for being a positive role model for their peers. And it's signed by all the school committee members and the superintendent. So as I call these incredible student ambassadors up, I would like for you to join me in giving them a thunderous, <laughs> thunderous applause. Of course. You can do the wave. Thing. So, First, I, it's my distinct honor to bring to forth Chloe Chavez. Woo! Thunderous. Woo -woo! Kamari Hill. Hence, Oscar Madeiras. <laughs> K. 
Caitlin Chavez. Amari Jean Baptiste. And finally, but certainly not last, Ileana Amaranti. And we have about 23 other students who are not here but I'm gonna be so happy to deliver this to them in person. Thank you. Do you wanna take pictures? No, no, I think, I think would, would they like to take pictures with school committee members? Renee. Photographer? You got a mug for the camera. Yeah, probably over there. Oh, that's it.
It's a warmer in here tonight. Cynthia, you ready? No, Tony's missing, but I figured we could at least get. I'm sorry, Sharon. <laughs> yeah, he's in the taking a bio break. <laughs> yeah, I figured he could commit. Oh, here he comes. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everybody, for your patience. Okay, on. next on the agenda, uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, you know, we, we have a district of 24, 25 schools and programs, so I'd like to, each school committee meeting, have a school, a middle school, an elementary school, two or three sometimes, because of the number of schools, to present what's going on at their school, news, goods, updates, uh, areas of focus, and, and uh, so the first school we'll have up today is uh, the Downey School with Principal Yolanda DeFalco. Wonderful. See the slide presentation. Hi, good evening, everyone. Dr. Wolder, are you um, going to kick us off? <laughs> All right, excellent. She's coming. I'm you're second on, on, on the docket. <laughs> you didn't need me for this. Uh, good evening, and as uh, Dr. Cobbs just said, one of the things that we want to make sure that we're doing is really highlighting the significant uh, work that is happening in our district. Our attendance for the district is at 92.2%. Our goal is 95. So we will be working to continue to move in that direction. Our enrollment is up slightly uh, our, from December 1st. That's not on that slide. So this is just district-wide. Um, we are currently at 15,227 students. So our enrollment is up slightly from this time last year. So we are trending upward and most of the enrollments um, are impacting our elementary level. And so our elementary numbers are climbing. And so what we are also seeing is a, sin a significant change in our multilingual learners. So since July 1st, the start of what would be the start of this school year, we have enrolled 932 multilingual learners. And so when we're looking at how we are programming schools, budgeting schools, we have trends that are happening in this district that we really wanna make sure that we're highlighting in this space, along with the actual work that is happening in our schools because our schools are rocking. We're not hearing enough of that and so when you get out and you get to see what they look like, how our kids are doing, how our teachers are functioning in spaces with all of the changes that have taken place, we really need to highlight and honor the work of education in this district in a way that we haven't had a chance to yet this year. So that is the purpose of us bringing the schools before you so the principals can tell their stories of what's happening in their schools so that we can also highlight some of the challenges that every school is facing and so that we can work together to make sure that we provide the best quality education for kids in Brockton. So handing it over to the principal of the Downey. Thank you very much. My name is Yolanda DeFalco. I'm the principal at the Downey School. 
I am a Brockton student, graduate of Brockton High School. Um, prior to being principal, I was a classroom teacher, an ESL teacher, and a literacy coach. So my lens is expansive. Um, Jennifer Colburn is our assistant principal. It's her first year with us as the assistant principal. She and I graduated from Brockton High School in the same year. Um, so that's really exciting. And the face of the front office, we have Mr. DJ Nazan. He is our admin assistant. We have just about 600 students in grades pre-K through five, and our specialized programs include integrated. We have integrated classrooms in pre-K through five. Life skills, we have pre-K, kindergarten, grades two and three for life skills classrooms, and we have grades three through five in EI, our emotionally impaired classrooms. Some areas that I'm really excited to share with you are um, building communities, our wonders implementation, and our thoughtful inclusion. So for building communities, this has been a huge piece that um, Mrs. Colburn and I started out this year, and we started strong with our new curriculum, the Character Strong Curriculum, and that is the social emotional learning curriculum that Brockton Public Schools brought in. Um, we have tied Character Strong itself, as well as the traits that go along with it, to our PBIS. We use it with morning announcements every single day. We use it at lunchtime. Um, one of the slogans with Character Strong is, what we practice becomes a habit, and good habits grow character. And we are really trying to instill in all of our students the different traits that help them build character. And we started um, Duck of the Month, so it's essentially your student of the month, citizen of the month. So um, our first traits we had were kindness, respect, responsibility, and gratitude. So our ducks of the month get a little certificate and a little rubber duck to bring home with them. Um, Character Strong has actually made a huge difference in the culture and the climate of the school in general. So we are really happy to see that implemented. Our restorative practices, last year all administrators had the opportunity to receive some training in restorative practices. And what we do is we help students work through problems. So we have them work through any conflicts that they're having, take accountability when accountability um, needs to be taken and um, go forward with either strengthening a relationship, building a relationship, repairing um, any harm that had happened. So that has been a huge piece this year. And something that we have spent a lot of time on, particularly with our fifth grade students, is um, an anti-bullying curriculum. So this was through essentially MARC, which is the Massachusetts Aggression Reduction Center. And we had reached out because we noticed that the fifth graders were having lots of conflicts in um, outside of school on online with the cyber bullying. We noticed that conflicts as far anything from just not being kind to putting their hands on each other. And we really wanted to do something to combat this issue that we saw and really um, strengthen our community in the fifth grade. So we reached out to the Mark Center and they were unable to have someone come out to our school um, to actually do a presentation, but they did send us the curriculum. So between myself, our assistant principal, um, and our school adjustment counselors, as well as the grade five classroom teachers, we have been taking the curriculum that they presented to us, um, really building the classroom community. And some of, the, um, some of the topics that are discussed are, what instances do you feel um, that you've been bullied in school, outside of school? Um, what are some of the issues that you see in the classroom? What are some ways that we can stand up for ourselves? What are some ways that we can help stop bullying? And together they problem solve. Um, we actually, one of the pictures that you see up there is the boy with his hands on a piece of paper. Um, one of the activities was the paper was crumpled and they had to pass it around and try to make it look brand new. And so that was um, a little analogy to once you hurt somebody, 
that they never are the same. So it has been very powerful um, for our students. We're seeing small changes in students. We're seeing big changes in students. So um, as far as things that I'm really proud of, the building communities is, uh, I think, our number one top spot. Also, we have Wonders implementation. All teachers are using the Wonders program with Fidelity. So every time we walk into a classroom, we see the Wonders materials out. Um, you see a small group, and there's also Lexia. There's a student on Lexia. Lastly, our thoughtful inclusion. We are, um, we have been really careful and thoughtful about maximizing inclusive opportunities for students with um, disabilities for specialists, lunch, recess, and academics. So our specialists um, have students in both sub-separate classrooms and general education classrooms together. They are always integrated into lunch academics as they are ready. We decide um, based on each student which subject they should begin include integrating into and then we start there and I say recess um, if you take a look we do have a brand new program a brand, brand new playground this year and the playground has some um, areas that are particularly designed for our special needs students so um, students in wheelchairs who have limited mobility can use the playground um, there are some sensory things on there so this has been it's something that all of our students, pre-K through five, general education and students with disabilities have really been able to enjoy. Some areas that we are working to address. Data analysis, as far as supporting structures and building capacity to use data effectively. We have plenty of data and our challenge comes in finding the time um, for for teachers to get together and to actually review, analyze, and then determine next steps. Professional development, um, increasing opportunities for teachers to meet regularly for planning, curriculum, and data review. Um, as I just mentioned, it's really finding time for like content area teachers or like grade level teachers to get together um, that's not impacting the school day. If they're out of their classroom, they're missing the, the instruction. So um, really being creative with that. And attendance. As far as attendance goes, we are monitoring, monitoring regularly. And we are trying to get all students to school by way of ensuring that their families have the support that they need to get students to school. Um, Character Strong is helping us build our school community so that the kids want to be there, um, but that is an area that we are also working to address. And here's my why we come to work every day. Um, just a couple of quotes. The first one goes along with Character Strong. A student said, I showed gratitude this morning. The crossing guard was helping kids cross the street, so I said thank you to him. Um, grade five student, the Downey School is so unique. Um, and I love the Downey School because it's a great school and everybody else gets to come here too. <laughs> and we have um, our wonderful custodians. We have Be the Reason Someone Smiles today. Um, each year he adds something and that's right in our front lobby when you walk in. Um, I have a picture of the, the boy holding the yellow paper, that's Brody, and he received a positive office referral. This is something else that ties into Character Strong. We ask teachers to um, check off which traits they are seeing, and we read their names over the announcements every Friday, and they come to the office, and we cheer, and we yell, and it's a whole big exciting thing for them. Um, there's a picture of Mrs. Colburn celebrating a friend's birthday. Everyone got to sing happy birthday to him. And lastly, our staff is so unbelievably dedicated. Um, and this particular picture was taken on Lee National Denim Day. And um, our staff and our students are one big community. And they are, they understand the reason that we come to work every day is for our students. Thank you very much. That is all I have. Do you have any questions for me? Nice work. Thank you very much.
<laughs> Thank you, Principal DeFalco. Um, next is, is Dr. Lovell from the Ashfield Middle School. Hi, everyone. Um, this is uh, Ms. Montron, uh, Charlene Montron. She is the Associate Principal at the Ashfield, and I am the Principal, and together we run the best school in the city. <laughs> All right. So I just wanted to um, give you a, little, a few quick facts about our school and, and who we are. Um, just to let you know, 78% of the whole uh, school got an A in citizenship. That means that they were not written up at all uh, for anything. Uh, so that's a huge uh, win. We've been doing it like Character Strong and some of the other um, programs as well, but that was a big win for us. Um, currently, we have uh, the second uh, highest enrollment uh, for the middle schools, um, right after the PLUF, then the Ashfield, even though we're not the biggest building. We're the smallest building. So um, that's been a little bit of an interesting thing this year. Um, we have right now in our school uh, 166 of our students, or 32%, are multi-language learners, which is a, a big deal. And most of those students are really new. Um, they've been, they come every day, every day we come in and there's a, there's a new kid. So uh, that's, a, that's a thing. <laughs> um, we do participate in the Empower you program, uh, Empower Yourself program. Um, with Mr. Turner, we've been working f since he first started in the district. Asheville was one of the first schools, and our kids are continuing um, with that. They're going to Bentley, I think, and then uh, next week uh, to the live trading room. So we have a lot of success with that program. So the Asheville always has a lot of students participate. Um, we have another win recently. I just checked the um, data, and we are under 10% of chronically absent, which is a, a big goal. Um, our, our target um, is like 15 or 16 percent, so we're well below our target right now, um, which means that students are li missing less than 10 percent. So we run that report and regularly check in on that. So this is a, that's a big win. Um, we have 184 of our students, or so 36 percent of the students are in the Honors Academy classes. So you can see if 30, like we have almost a reverse curve here, we have you know, a lot of real, real newcomers and then we have Honors Academy. So it's a, it's a pretty uh, interesting mix of students in our school. Um, we have an Asheville Allies group, which helps to su support diversity in our school. They meet twice a week um, at, during elective time. That's what they choose to do with their time. So students who are not in an active intervention are able to go and be part of our allies, which is a, a great thing. Um, we have a 21st century after school program. We're targeting mostly sixth graders this year. Um, there's a lot of sort of career kind of focus in those um, programs that we're running. 20% um, of all of our students, so 102 kids, are uh, students with disabilities. Um, and of that number, 35% of the 20% are um, sub substantially separate students in our city resource room program. So um, again, we have a lot of high need students in our school. Um, uh, one of our, another thing that we were able to do this year to our, our moderate special needs uh, teachers, we were able to assign them so that um, there's an eighth grade, uh, a teacher working just with the eighth grade math and science and one working with the English and now they're able to get into the common planning so they can be part of the lessons from the start and not having to go in and um, sort of find out what the plan is and how to remediate for students so they're right in with the planning of the lesson. So we're pretty excited um, to try that out this year and it seems to be working really well. All right, so these are the areas that we're really proud of, our, th our three big areas. We're um, for the uh, accountability status from last year's MCAS, we hit the 30th percentile, which was a lot of growth, and we had 55% um, substantial growth toward our targets, and that's across um, many of the subgroups were also significant, especially our multi-language learners. Um, they have met uh, their targets for attaining language proficiency, so they actually met the target, which is great. Um, it's very hard to do because as they improve, they're reclassified and taken out of the group. So you, to continue to make that progress is a big deal and the teachers have been working very, very hard um, on that. And the other thing um, which impacts our school that's been a big deal is um, since we began uh, PBAS in um, like 2019 is when we first rolled it out. We had, it for the first three months of school, about uh, 562 sort of write-ups of uh, behavior issues back then. Um, last year, we were, you know, having coming back from COVID, our PBIS in full swing, the teachers really working on building positive relationships with the students. It went um, down to 291, all right? Um, 
I'm sorry, it went from 469, so we went from 562 down to 469. And this year, for the first three months of school, we were at 291. So that's anything from kids being written up from not having, you know, uh, uh, not being on time to different, different uh, issues. It's been a great drop in, in that. So we're really excited about the culture that we're building in the school, and I think a lot of it comes from the relationships um, that the teachers are actively trying to um, cultivate. All right, so what's, what's the downside? What are the things that we're working on now? The big things we're really trying to target is, like I said, we have a huge amount of uh, students, uh, multi-language learners, newcomers in our school. Um, in our sixth grade right now, uh, the class size is 40 um, in the class. Um, and there is not a para in there to support them. We're just getting, I think it was just approved last night. Ironic. Um, no, that's great. Um, but that is uh, that was just approved. So at least we can get someone who help, hopefully is a bilingual parent who can speak the language because right now that's a big barrier with all the newcomers. Many of our students haven't um, used a lot of technology before and I'll, it's a big part of our school. Um, so just teach, getting kids to log on, trying to get 40 kids to log on in 45 minutes is really a big challenge. So these are the things that we're struggling with. And grades, uh, grade seven, not that much better, 38 in the class. And 31, uh, grade seven is 38 and 31 in grade eight. So this is something that, you know, that we are struggling with right now, but hopefully um, we can continue to um, make progress with the students. Um, you can see um, that the kids are not misbehaving, they're not, in the, there's a lot of great learning coming on. Um, we actually have um, some teachers from other schools coming to watch our teachers deal um, with their kids and there's amazing lessons happening in the classroom. So it's a great testament to the hard work of the teachers. Um, the other thing, class size, so when we look at, you know, well why maybe we could move some kids out, the, the regular, uh, the not regular, but the students who are not in the bilingual program, um, are also very high numbers. So, you know, we have 31, 32, 27, so it's not like there's 10 or 8 in another room. So we got, we got high numbers everywhere, um, especially grades 7 and 8. Um, we used to have six sections. Um, with last year's cuts, we went down to only five sections, so we're taking the kids, dividing them up by into five sort of cohorts for the day. So it's been a little bit of a struggle, and that's something that um, we're looking to address. So those are our, you know, challenges that we're, and every day we come up with a new way to um, work on it. Okay, so now the last slide that we're given. Uh, why do we come to work every day? Uh, I have a quote from uh, one of our seventh grade students, Destiny. Um, I like how the Asheville Middle School makes me feel safe and comfortable. I can be myself and make a lot of friends. That's why I love the Asheville. Uh, that's what makes it different from other schools is I love being here. We do have a lot of uh, great things going on for students, whether it's, um, you know, the, the band, the electives, the honor roll assembly that was in the corner. We had like a candy bar bingo for all the students who made honor roll. Um, but, and also, I know if you may have seen us on television the other day with the New England Patriots and the Naval Academy, um, retired Naval Academy Minority Outreach Program came to our school with these robots and the students were able to program them and race them. It was, it was an amazing thing. That's, uh, Dietrich Wise, who didn't play in the game, so, so he didn't, uh, hopefully he didn't get anything at the Asheville because he wasn't well enough to play, so. Um, but we have a lot going on. Um, we have the zoo coming in in two weeks. Yep, next week. Next week, all right. We've had, um, we've been to Gillette Stadium also to do a helmet concussion um, protocol thing about building helmets. We've um, been doing a lot of active things in and out of the building. Been to some of the kids have been to the zoo. We're headed to the science museum. So we're really trying to keep as much engaging thing and open the kids' horizons for as many new experiences as possible. Any questions? Hi. That's it. Good. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Second to exit. 
So as I mentioned, we, you know, we, we have a district of a lot of schools. I you know, you know, Brockton High School, rightfully so, has taken up a lot of time and energy, but you know, we, we need to make sure we recognize what's going on in the rest of the district and the great work, the hard work that the teachers and, and staff are doing in the buildings. And you know, when I, when I do the school visits I walk through, it's, it, it's amazing, it's great. You know, the students are they're engaged, they're in the classroom, the teachers are engaging, they're working in groups, they're working, you know, doing lectures. So, um, we have challenges, but there's a lot going on and a lot of good going on in the district. So, yeah, there is. Like I said, so every, every school committee look for, you know, two schools at least to present. Sometimes we might do three just to kind of give you updates and, you know, get news, goods, and challenges. But, and I just want to thank, you know, Principal DeFalco and, and Dr. Lovell for their presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, any questions on anything? Any comments? Okay. Next, I just want to do a quick update, a quick update on the yonder bags. Um, I see we made the newspaper again about the yonder bags. And so I, I really did take a second look and reached out to the representatives from the company. And um, they, they actually have changed their policy somewhat because of the feedback from other you know, organizations, school districts. So now we don't have to lease the bags. However, we have to purchase the bags. And we still have to purchase enough bags for the whole high school. Okay. So, which means, you know, and, and, and if we purchase them, you have to purchase enough. So if you were gonna use them for the whole school, you'd have to like 10% to turn over. So we would have to purchase about 4,000 bags at $30 each, which would bring the, the cost to about $120,000. Exactly. <laughs> and, and then there's four, and the, the requirement, the yonder company does do training, you know, so they, there'll be four people, because like, there's one each, each main entrance for each house in the morning to help train on how to use the bags. So that comes with a cost of $2,500 each, so it's another $10,000. So it's about $130,000 if we really want to go down that avenue with the yonder bags. So for some reason, and I could be wrong, I'm looking at Mr. Rodriguez mm -hmm. to make sure I'm not crazy, but I thought they were like 10 or $11 each. You know, and they, they again, they, they shared this to me. They, they had a new pricing structure. It was $30, $30 each. And I think that's because they're, it's a purchase, not a lease anymore, because obviously they made money on the lease. So, yeah. um, I just, I had actually looked online to see where there were alternatives to the Yonder bag, and I did find another company um, that did similar, um, but, you know, the different trade offs. So the, um, this company is called Phone Locker. And they're a co company out of, uh, I think it's Australia. <coughs> and they, they sell the bags as well, between $15 and $30 per, per pouch for students. They have the same locking mechanism and magnet uh, that, that the uh, Yonder bags have. But again, they're, they're a foreign company, so I'm not sure how the exchange rate would work. And, and again, it's a purchase, so, and, and their policy is pretty similar. You purchase enough for the whole student body. So. Mm -hmm. Um, just to we address that, the other thing is, you know, we, I know, I think initially we talked about using the Yonder bags, it was the eighth grade as well as the, the uh, high school, but you know, from my understanding and walking through the middle school, phones are not an issue in the middle schools. They're put away, they're in the bags, they're, it's, it's not an issue at all. It, it's really the high school, so. So. Um, so the only, couple things. Number sure. one, thank you so much for doing the additional research because it's something that you know, not only did the yonder bags make it into the papers, mm -hmm. but one of the other things that has been coming up more and more is they're, you know, recommending cell phone policies. Like you see it everywhere mm -hmm. now where schools are all considering cell phone policies. So I, I kind of feel like we're not, you know, stepping out into unwanted territory. Mm -hmm. I feel mm -hmm. like we're right where everyone else is and mm -hmm. trying to, you know, kind of push structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My question is, the only other the only other bag or security mechanism is out of the country versus yonder there isn't any um, I mean that just it that's sounds crazy it is I, I was surprised as well but that's that's what I found and I you know I didn't I, I sent an inquiry online but I haven't heard back from them uh, as far as what what their policy their procedure is and, and purchasing and, and, and actually get a real price for Brockton High School but I will follow up on that and I mean, understood, mm -hmm. we have a huge high school, so it's like, obviously, for us, like, you know, uh, purposes. Australia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but Mr. Rodriguez, please. Um, I know Desi had a program mm -hmm. that will support us financially um, with the policy, so I'm trying to 
there was like a reimbursement or something. Like if mm. we did it, they, they would, yeah, they, they would fund it a certain portion. So yeah. I, I mean, if it's if we're gonna purchase it and. Mm -hmm. um, because that's what they're looking at across the Commonwealth is to see what school districts are, what policies are working, what's not working, so they can come up with their own because it's eventually going to take full effect. But I was I'm just trying to figure out what the actual numbers is, if we can mm -hmm. look into it, because I know I'll look into that, it. that was mentioned um, in previous meetings about um, them supporting um, the cost mechanism behind it. And I know that Springfield used Yonder because that's where we went, but I'd be curious in what Lawrence is using and some mm -hmm. of the other districts that are also, you know, mm -hmm. doing cell phone, have cell phone policies, if they are also Yonder or if they've used a different company. Any other questions on the floor? I just want to make sure you open it up to everyone. Thank you for the research, Dr. Cobbs. You're welcome. Okay. You want this? Yes, please, and thank you. Um, if you want, I can, I can email a copy of that to everybody who else. Or I'll thank scan you. it and email it to everyone. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, so the next update is from uh, uh, City CFO, Troy Clarkson, and financial, we have a few things to discuss with financial update. I'll give everybody else a copy but myself. Mm -hmm. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the school committee. I'm happy uh, once again to be before you to discuss uh, several issues actually, but certainly a general uh, update on the, the status of finances in the Brockton Public Schools. As has become our custom, we've provided you uh, with a general update, the uh, budget summary that we've been sending you before every meeting I did. Uh, at the request of member Azak, send this to you yesterday so you had some time to review. If you'd like for future reports to have them uh, sent uh, even earlier, then we're happy to do that. Uh, but in looking at the report, uh, the spending continues to be within prescribed limits. Uh, I will talk in a minute about an effort that we're undertaking uh, to integrate all of the spending. As I've mentioned several times, this is general fund spending but does not incorporate uh, revolving funds and grants. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but just wanted to speak to you uh, in, a, in a general way and, and I'll certainly, as always, answer any questions you might have. Uh, one of the uh, issues that has emerged in the last several weeks as we continue to review and provide feedback on the position control forms uh, that we're using to verify funds behind positions um, is that because the budget is set up uh, in Munis the way that it is, and we've talked about this every time I've come to visit you, uh, there may be requests for positions uh, where there's no money in that particular line or that particular area. Uh, so we've developed a system uh, Dr. Cobbs, myself, and our respective teams. Um, if you remember the last time we were here, we talked about the difference between the budget that you voted as a school committee and the budget that exists in this report. And so uh, within those what we call statutory categories, within the, the, the budget that you approved, uh, under the... Uh, authority vested in the superintendent, money can be moved uh, within those categories. So we've developed a system where temporarily for this year's budget, uh, we have the ability uh, to document moving some of that money around within the budget so that position control forms that come to my office can be supported uh, by identifying areas where there are surplus funds right now and moving them to places where needs exist to fill positions. And so uh, we're able to not only process those more swiftly, but to do so in a way uh, that provides funding where it needs to go. Uh, and I think that's an important development of us working together that prioritizes the needs that are identified by Dr. Cobbs and his team uh, to uh, to put people where they're needed. Uh, and so that, that's an important development. Uh, as we continue to try to understand uh, the totality of the budget and 
uh, where the funds are available, we're really trying uh, to maximize the effort to give principals uh, and department heads the flexibility uh, to conduct their operations uh, w without limitations. And so that, I think, is an important development. Related to that, I think in the coming weeks, you're going to hear the term roster review probably quite often. Uh, that's an initiative that we've undertaken uh, with the support and really under the leadership of uh, our consultant TJ Plant from Open Architects. We're trying to develop a firm understanding uh, of the relationship between the employees in the Brockton Public Schools uh, and how they fit into the budget because we're uh, at this point not completely confident that uh, that the budget reflects how people are actually being paid, where they're being paid from. Uh, so today, Dr. Cobb sent out a memo to all of the principals and department heads with an actual proposed, uh, we're, uh, as best as the information as we have at this point, with a roster of who we believe uh, is employed in those buildings or in those departments. Asking each of those principals and department heads to uh, review that list, to give feedback to us as to the people that are or are not um, being paid out of those areas, that will allow us to have a much more accurate picture of the fiscal year 24 budget, where the money's being directed, where people are being paid from, uh, and that'll give us a picture of, a, a clearer picture than this spreadsheet uh, of where we're at so far this fiscal year. Along with that, I met this afternoon uh, with some school and city finance folks um, and we are working toward providing feedback to, uh, again, principals, department heads, but also their, their administrative support staff uh, in really understanding on a more granular level uh, what people are being paid from uh, grants and from revolving funds. Uh, because we're now trying to move uh, to understand where folks may be paid out of grants or revolving funds. Possible that folks are being paid out of grants that have expired uh, or revolving funds that, uh, that don't have money behind them. Um, so once we gather all of that information, we will have, I think, uh, a much more accurate snapshot of where we are in fiscal 24 that we can then discuss with you. And that's really important. It's painstaking, very detailed work, uh, but I want to thank Dr. Cobbs and his team in the central office for, uh, for really being cooperative and trying to help us understand this uh, and, and gather the tools that, that we really need to make that happen. What that will also do, and I know I say this at every meeting, but uh, it's really our goal. All of this information that we're gathering will allow us to then work with Dr. Cobbs and his team to present you a fiscal year 2025 budget that has detailed information by school, by department, of who is supported in those organizations, what it costs to run those operations, and suggest to you that you actually vote a budget that reflects those costs. Uh, what that will do is allow us then, moving forward, uh, to have uh, a rolling uh, understanding and a much more accurate picture on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, however often you'd like us to report on exactly what the costs are. Because what we can tell you today is in general, uh, we think general fund spending is within the limits that you prescribed in the budget, but it's difficult to draw a correlation between uh, this budget report that we provide to you at every meeting and an actual reflection of what it costs to run each building or each operation in, in, the, in the Brockton Public Schools. So we've made what I think is some significant progress in developing that information. We'll continue to report on it to you. Uh, but I'm pleased that I think we're, uh, we're, we're really moving forward in a productive way. One of those ways that we're trying to move forward uh, is one of the, the sub items that I'm before you on tonight. As I mentioned at one of my first, uh, one of my first reports to you, uh, the school committee uh, is the body that has the ability, the duty, the responsibility 
to vote on paying prior year bills. Uh, we have compiled a list and they are before you tonight. Uh, not only uh, a memo from me and, a sp and an attached spreadsheet, but actually each of the invoices. These are bills that have been provided to us, to the school uh, business office and to my office that are, are prior year bills and the proper way to address those is to bring them before the school committee uh, and ask you for a vote. As you can see, the totality of these bills amounts to uh, just over $113,000 uh, in anticipation of the question uh, of where that money is going to come from. If you have your budget report with you, uh, in the section that's listed net school spending, under business office, you'll see under business office, there's a line uh, for contract services uh, that, that has a balance of well over $2 million, and that's where we will pay these bills from. They're from a variety of, uh, of places, but for now, just to try to track them, uh, that's where the money will come from. So yes, the funds do exist in the budget to address these. There are others, we believe, unpaid bills from fiscal year 2023. Uh, but we're working with uh, all of th the schools and departments to try to compile those and, uh, and hopefully at your next meeting or shortly thereafter we'll have the, the final number of prior year bills. Um, so if any of you uh, watch the city council meeting, you'll see that uh, this is a fairly common practice with them as well. It usually occurs when vendors send their bills into the, the district or the city after the fiscal year has closed and there's usually a window of several weeks. If those bills are received after that period or in some cases sometimes uh, departments have bills and they get lost in the shuffle or they folks forget to send them, whatever the case is, obviously this year in the Brockton Public Schools has been a little extraordinary. Uh, the, some may have had concerns that there weren't funds to pay the bills. At any rate, we're compiling these. It's important to bring them before you so in the light of day these, these prior bills are being addressed. Uh, and it's just one more step we're taking to try to, to, uh, to tighten up the operation and to, to have discussions here where they belong about what our financial responsibilities are. Um, so that's all I have for a general update. Um, Actually, th there was a w one, uh, one more item, and that is, uh, it's listed on here, an appropriation of funds. What that really encompasses, what I've already talked to you about, uh, as we progress uh, through the fiscal year and develop that deeper understanding of, of exactly where the cost centers are, uh, we may come to you and ask you to move money when there's money that's required within those statutory categories that you voted back in last June, if money needs to be moved between those categories, that can't be done within the staff. That requires a school committee vote. So we're monitoring that, those numbers closely uh, and may ask you to do some of those uh, transfers as well. But I wanted to highlight for you before we even contemplated that, that that too is a role of the school committee and something we may do. If we are able successfully to work with you to create um, a, a budget for next year uh, that's much more detailed than the budget you voted for this year, that will become not in every meeting but a more common occurrence because the budget will actually be voted in more detail than it is now uh, allocating the money to each operation where, where we think it should be. So uh, we're we're always working in three fiscal years, closing out one, planning, uh, working within one, and planning for another. And that's what we're doing right now. Uh, so we're uh, getting ready, I think, to, uh, to close the chapter that was fiscal year 23. Uh, and hopefully you'll have more to say on that in coming meetings. But we're working very hard in the current fiscal year to, to be more accountable and transparent and already starting to plan for next year. So, Madam Chairman, thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. So, I have one quick one, and this is, uh, I want to just be clear, this is no reflection on you at all, but 
why would we be getting invoices that are dated like August of 2022? I'm just curious. Like, it, you know, I understand that some invoices could be left on a desk or something else. I just, it's December. So I'm just wondering, like, how could, it, and it scares me that we have this pile, but this could possibly not be the last of it. So I'm just curious, I guess I'm just curious, like, are these the processes that TJ is looking at as well to say, okay, we should have gotten these invoices in a more timely manner, or there's not a process in place to ensure we get the invoices in a timely manner? I just am trying to understand. So uh, the answer is yes, this is most certainly a process that we're trying to bring some structure, some written policies, and some order to. Uh, and I think it's the lack of structure and written policies that have led to this and okay. so one of the things we'll be doing is uh, working with the school committee and with the administration to develop written policies uh, for how this sort of thing should should be done um, I, by, by comparison I can tell you we working with the, under the leadership of the mayor uh, two years ago passed Brockton's first set of financial policies so written policies are something uh, that I think act as guideposts and guardrails for municipal and school operations. Uh, but with turnover, uh, so much here was done by tradition and when someone would leave a, a slot, they'd say to the next person that followed them, here's how we do things. Mm -hmm. Formalizing that and modernizing that with written policies I think will help prevent this sort of thing happening in the future. Thank you. Any other questions on the floor? Mr. Homer. Um, so thank you, Mr. Clarkson, for providing those. I, it, so just to quickly recap, it, these are invoices for vended services. A lot of them look like you know, just um, mach mechanical, machinery, um, structural services, s equipment supplies. There are invoices from 2020 in here uh, from almost $5,000 for um, police services at various schools. Um, I, I kind of I share Miss Ayler's concern that we're just getting things now from 2020, um, and I think this just shows how how quickly things add up. That we're we're finding things that we don't know. Um, when you mention policies and things, because these are vendors that we're contracting with to provide services to us, we're gaining the benefit of those services in the buildings, and the students are gaining those benefits, but how can we create policies that require those vendors to provide us with the invoices and what is the recourse when they come to us th almost four years later with a bill that hasn't been paid um, is that an a, a public schools accounting office oversight where they're they're not watching that they haven't paid out an expected service that was obtained by the district or is that can we expect that vendors will just come up to us with unpaid invoices from years ago <laughs> prior to some of us serving on the school committee and say this previous school committee never paid us for these services? It's an excellent question. So I, I'll give you a little textual, a little history. You know, I've, I've worked in several different communities in, in my career. In a town, these unpaid bills would be paid at uh, either a fall or a spring town meeting, uh, generally in, in the spring, but could, but could be paid at both. Um, in a city, it's done by the city council, or in this case, the school committee. Uh, this is sort of conjecture, uh, but I would say when local vendors understand that the city or town is vigilant uh, uh, about getting vendors to get paid, uh, and that it possibly, if you submit it late, it could take weeks or months to get paid, then they tend to, to tighten it up. So I agree that we couldn't, we can't pass a policy to hold vendors accountable. But I think we can be more uh, aggressive and uh, track through various means internally uh, what vendors have provided services and not build us and then follow up with them to try to encourage them to bill more timely. This, I will tell you, is an extraordinary amount. Uh, uh, but I think Correct me if I'm wrong, but for those committee members that have been here for some time, 
Uh, I don't think this is a practice that's been employed previously in that in recent memory you've had unpaid bills. But as we can see from this, there are bills from previous years that probably should have come before the school committee. So we're trying to clean up something that, uh, that has been an issue for a while. I, they're probably, aren't probably, I learned this afternoon, there are more. I'm guessing there may be vendors watching this on television that say, geez, there might be something. So we can expect to see these trickle in, hopefully not for much longer, uh, but it's one of the things we're working on to try to prevent in the future. Mr. Rodriguez, please. Um, so, and I know Kathy, you were in the training with me. So this is basically a system where I think that we should implement a warrant system. Um, tell me if I'm wrong. You know, when it comes to paying bills, I think that there should be a warrant system in order to make sure that these bills are actually paid on time. Because when you, it's concerning that you know we have an invoice from 1022. You know, it's so the, over the, a year. The bills are paid on a warrant system here. Uh, I think what's, what's missing here is the bills not getting to, to be processed for whatever reason. Uh, and, and that's why the, their prior year bills, uh, and you can't simply pay a prior year bill on a warrant if the time has passed and the books are closed, then it has to come before the school committee. So I understand that with the warrant system, so who on the school committee has that ability to sign it because the school committee has to be involved in that warrant system. So you're telling me that we have a warrant system, so I'm trying to figure out who on the committee, or is that something that's been missed throughout the years? So over at City Hall, we have a warrant system, and the mayor executes the warrant for vendors to be paid. Um, and that's, that includes school committee, school department bills that, that come over to the city. Uh, I'm not aware whether or not it's been a practice or not a practice for the school committee to, to execute warrants here as well. Something we can certainly look into. I don't I don't want to step on your toes, Mr. No, I know, but I mean, like, yeah, just, I just being curious, I would, I think we need to take a deeper dive to see who um, has the authority on the warrant system here on the school side. I mean, is it the mayor, um, his authority as being the chairman to sign off on that? Um, I think there should be an elected member of the seven wards that signs off on that or a, a sub-separate um, subcommittee to make sure that these bills are, are being paid on time and that that's checks and balances. I don't want to answer specifically. I can answer broadly. Uh, again, communities where I've worked, depending on the form of government, uh, the actual charter in a community, uh, I have seen communities where the, the executive meaning the town administrator or the town manager, uh, executes warrants. Others where that, uh, because of the charter, that authority is vested in a select board. Uh, so it varies by community, so I would suggest it's something we can and should look at here to see if the process that's being followed matches uh, what, what's in our city charter. No, I, I agree with you. I mean, we, you know, we're all looking for answers just to make sure that you know, everything is being done properly. Um, you know, we should just, you know, I know we don't have a legal here, but just to make sure that, mm -hmm. that we, you know, that, you know, we do have a warrant system and we're not, you know, when did that warrant system um, process fall apart? Um, in my four years, I've never, I've never seen a warrant system here and I've mm -hmm. been training with Mrs. Up, the mm -hmm. vice chair, you know, we, we looked at each other like, we need to implement this. Um, and this is way before the, uh, the financial uh, crisis. And I, sorry. No, no. And, and to Mr. Rodriguez's point, um, I think we were both looking for the warrant system to uh, manifest in our accounts review subcommittee. And so that's something that we should look at in terms of how that information is actually getting to us so that we can make those decisions in a timely manner versus getting a stack that's this big, and this is no reflection on you, getting a stack of papers this big on everything that's already happened in the past. Sure. Nothing that uh, requires decision or meaningful discussion that's coming up. And I think that's part of the process that we've been missing. 
um, as a committee, that's mm -hmm. all. But to Mr. Rodriguez's point, I think we need to go backward to go forward in regards to that. Just to um, piggyback, it's just like, you know, if I'm a vendor and I'm providing um, some of these services and it's been over a year, I don't think, you know, I, you know, I would say that, you know, the city of Brockton is not, you know, friendly when it comes to doing business because they're not paying their bills. Uh, so, yeah, we definitely we need to take a deeper dive to, you know, come with a better process and a, a quicker one so that we are paying our bills on time. Cause we know there's late fees um, and making sure these are all budgeted appropriately when it comes to that. So, because I know with some of these bills, you know, we're dealing with uh, a deficit is more of, did we budget for these bills that haven't been paid for over a year? And I mean, <coughs> some of these bills are from the Brockton Police Department with all due respect and it's for you know, work that was done in March 2020 supporting the polls. I'm like, I'm, I'm looking at this and thinking, I hope these officers got paid. <laughs> I'm sure they did, but you know what yes. I mean? So anyway, thank you very much, Mr. Clarkson. I appreciate it. Can I just add, just ask sure, one more Mr. question Holmer. too? This, Mr. Clark, there's, there's a couple of bills in here from Eversource, but the, the due date for payment is coming up this month on the 11th of this month. But I just don't understand why that money wouldn't get paid out of the utilities category that we have. Why would we take from a different category to pay bills that we're actually under, we're under budget in our utilities category. We're at 22.76% for spending. We're at 30.54% including encumbrances and things. But I just, I don't understand why even just like small amounts, like this is a, a bill for $891, but it's not due yet. And why would we? Why would we spend money from a different category instead of from utilities to pay Eversource for services at Colonel Bell Drive? <laughs> I apologize. I don't, I, I don't know the page number, but it's pretty deep into the packet. It's probably toward the center of the packet before the... Uh, uh, it was National Grid, right? Uh, it's or was it Eversource? Okay, gotcha. So. I'm just confused just because it feels like if we have to vote on things like that I just I don't un I I look through it quickly but I I don't I understand where some of these come from and again that uh, I don't want to take the job of deciding which accounts we're paying things from and micromanaging it but I just think like if we have a budgeted amount for energy services or utilities and things and then we get a bill from Eversource I mean it's not even due yet but it's not something that seems to would fit into this category of an overdue bill or something that we haven't spent from previous years. I don't know if that's... No, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it and uh, let me speak to the broad question you ask and then, then to this specific bill because it, okay. in, in looking at it, uh, this bill should probably be on a regular warrant and I'm honestly not sure why it got in here with this list of unpaid bills, but the br to the broader question, um, we're trying to understand uh, how much, how many and how much of these unpaid bills are out there. Mm -hmm. uh, so paying them out of that one source, uh, I think gives us the opportunity for this year to quantify exactly uh, the, the scope of the, the, the problem. Uh, and I, although I understand we do have in the Munis report, uh, lines for utilities, mm -hmm. but as I've stated before, one of the real challenges we have in trying to understand the budget is that this report does not necessarily correspond to the budget that you voted. Uh, so we're trying to actually reconstruct a budget uh, that will realistically be for next fiscal year that is a very detailed, accurate reflection of what it costs to run the school department. Because the categories that you voted in the budget last spring were so broad, uh, the, the true budget is in very broad categories and um, the, the lines that you see here are for accounting purposes but don't relate to the budget that you passed. So under normal circumstances, you're absolutely correct. 
if you look on the city side budget then the utility lines or, or utility costs are paid out of there mm -hmm. we're struggling to understand uh, how this munis budget was created and for what purposes because that's as i mentioned earlier we're transferring money uh, on a fairly regular basis now to accommodate requests for positions because those portions of the budget weren't funded. Uh, so we have uh, a budget that is not reflective of the costs to run the school department. And, and so at least for these unpaid bills, uh, tracking them in their total so that we know what the scope of the problem was is useful for us in trying to create uh, a more accurate budget for next year. But as to that specific bill, I'll take a look uh, and, and try to understand what, what the team was thinking and maybe uh, m mistook that for a different bill uh, because it is a, it's a current year bill. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I understand, if I, if I understand correctly, then it sounds like by looking at, do you mean to say like by taking a deeper dive of looking at the operating costs and expenses at each of the sites, each of the school buildings, allows you to make a better projection of how the 2025 budget should look? That's exactly right. Right, okay. So, yeah, and, and does that does that mean you're looking at energy costs and expenses and heating and gas? Um, waste all those all those costs for each building are those billed separately and is that is that what you mean like that might be why you would see utility bills like okay right okay. And, and 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 i've seen it done by the way uh both ways in municipal and school budgets so when we craft that fy 25 budget we may suggest to you because ultimately it's your decision to allocate those energy costs by school mm -hmm. or in some communities i've seen it uh more generalized and that in a facilities budget you have an overall budget for gas and electric costs that's then internally allocated to each building and so as we progress throughout the year we'll work with dr cobbs and the facilities team and then you as to how we want to represent that but now we're really we're more fact finding than than anything else okay Can I ask one last question? I'm so sorry, and I apologize because I know I, I was late the last time that you spoke, Mr. Clarkson, but I was looking at the non-net school spending, um, the first mm -hmm. page of the non-net school spending uh, in, in our packet here, and I was looking at the transportation and special education, and I just, just looking quickly at the percent used and expensed and encumbrances, it looks like we're at 92% and 98% for um, in, I think that must be in district and out of district, um, non-net school spending, and uh, those are categorized in the uh, fifth and sixth line of the transportation budget. Um, I'm just thinking in terms of where these charts that we're providing, that we're showing to the public and things, where we're at, we're expecting to be at about 42.9 percent of spending through this date of this meeting. Um, I just wanted to check on, on what the encumbrances were for. Is that projected cost through the, through the year for students that are placed in special education settings and, are, and require the transportation for the year? Or would we expect that we're reaching 98 or 97 percent of a budget item for tra school transportation for special education and we're not halfway through the year and we've, is that a situation like you said where we haven't accounted for the cost and it's going to cost us double what we thought. Sorry. <laughs> no, don't, please don't apologize. That's why I come, so we can have this, this dialogue. It, it, I think it's helpful for the school committee and for the public to see that mm -hmm. we're actually having the conversations we're supposed to have mm -hmm. about what it costs to run the Brockton Public Schools. Mm -hmm. So just this afternoon, mm -hmm. uh, I had uh, a fairly detailed discussion with some of our uh, finance folks uh, our acting budget director, Evan LaCasse, on the city side, and uh, Sarah Butler, who's an accountant on the school side, about that very question. Okay. Uh, because there are costs that are reflected in this non-net school spending munis budget uh, that are incurred that are addressed with additional aid from the Commonwealth. 
Uh, and so they are reflected here because this is how the budget was constructed in Munis. But we had a discussion uh, about the best way actually to reflect those costs, understanding that, uh, that there's additional funding from the Commonwealth to address some of those out of district costs and that they should not be part of the, the, the net school spending budget. Uh, but because the transportation department has not had a line item budget, uh, that th this is how the costs have been reflected. So uh, it, it's, it's a keen observation on your part, uh, and it's something that we're aware of, that it skews what it actually, what the non-net costs are, because those costs should be reflected uh, in some other way, uh, whether it's through uh, a, a fund or we reflect them in a different way because those costs uh, are addressed through a different funding source. Okay. Does that answer make sense to you? It does. I mean, that, that was, again, it was my concern. I know this was something we discussed with the 2023 budget was the cost of transportation and specifically mm -hmm. transportation in the special education realm knowing that some, some students are transported from out of town, some students are transported to schools out of town, um, and we're required, <coughs> we're obligated to provide that. But it just, when I, when I see that amount um, already, you know, um, you know the, the true remaining budget, such small numbers and the percent used to date, um, I just wanted to ensure that, you know, we have a plan for <laughs> making sure that students are getting where they need to go um, and that we know and we can anticipate what the cost would be. But knowing now that there is funding from outside, I mean, obviously the, the question is what amount is that? But that's, again, that's another one of those alarming things is if we have to wait until June to find out what we're going to receive from out of state, um, out, out of district funding or, or resources to help supplement that. Um, that's, again, that's that part where, you know, kind of left gasping, like, do we know how much we're going to have to spend in total this year, do, have we budgeted enough for that? Um, and obviously, I mean, that's, that's you're, you're, you really can't plan, it's very difficult, I think, to plan for the next year not knowing which students you have in district that might need those services and how do you prepare a budget expecting to send students to out of district placements. You really can't do that. You don't want to plan to do that, but um, that's, thank you. I think that addresses some of that. I, I will, as a follow-up, uh, uh, look at those rather large encumbrances of the 281 mm -hmm. and the 298,000. My hunch uh, is that those are for contracts that have been executed to transport students, and so the encumbrance has been requested to ensure that there is sufficient funding for the rest of the year. Okay. But I will confirm that Thank because you. those are large encumbrances. Okay, that's what I thought. Thank you. Any other, Mr. Rodriguez? <coughs> um, Mr. Clark, I like your idea of when we actually craft the budget to actually have the utilities per school, mm -hmm. which will give us a better uh, microscope on which schools are using more electricity, like, so we can get to the root of the problem that maybe there's something that we're missing, um, you know, ventilation or new windows or something. Um, to break that into, you know, to break it down. So I think that that should be the course. That's just my my opinion, which will be easier for us instead of looking at one document that, you know, we can look at the Gilmore, we can look at the Kennedy or the high school and see uh, which schools are wasting. Um, and then, you know, obviously that's some data for us to, to break in. The only question I have, um, Dr. Cobbs, if you can um, answer this, I know we have an IT department. And I know they're just not changing toners on, on printers. Here we, we have a service to Ockers. Um, and I know I'm not, when it was you know, explained to us when we were installing these um, vape sensors, I thought that was supposed to be going through our IT department to actually install it. So I'm just curious of why we get in the bill for install. No, you know, we for this we didn't install it with the IT we department. Didn't. They, they did. We, we contracted out. We, we don't have the technician to, to actually install them. We have one, actually, Joe Campbell. He's right the there. only one. Right. So. 
the IT uh, techs don't do the pull you know, wires generally and, and install you know, things like that, equipment like that. They're really computer equipment uh, and you know, laptops, et cetera, projectors. You know, they, they don't do the hard wiring and, and, and install the smoke detectors, vape detectors, those kind of things. That would be, again, that's Joe, basically. So that's why we end up subbing out a lot of the work. Okay. I mean, I think we'll have a different discussion off camera. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. All right. Clarkson. Thank you all very much. Time. Oh, yeah, we do have to vote on the. Um, okay. So uh, for the bills, I would entertain a motion for us to approve the packet of overdue, honestly, unpaid bills from years <laughs> for $113,619.68 towards bills for services rendered in a prior year. $113,619.68 towards bills and services rendered in prior years. So that's a second. Can I get a second? Second. Okay, Mr. Rodriguez first, properly seconded by Ms. Sullivan. Can I get a show of hands? And can you oh, ask you want Mr. to do a roll call because yeah. he's remote. Yeah, okay, I'll do a roll call because of Mr. Sullivan. Ms. Sullivan. Yes. Mr. Homer. No. Uh, Ms. Uh, Rivas Mendez. Yes. Mr. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. And I'm a yes. Okay. Um, okay, so it's been passed. Um, do we have any items to refer to subcommittee? Sure. Okay. All right, let's move on to the consent agenda. We have A through F. Um, I want to throw it out to the floor. Does anybody have anything on the consent agenda that they'd like to take out of order? No. Motion to approve consent agenda. Okay, and um, I let me read through each one of them and then we can take a um, vote on on including all of them. So, uh, A, approval of minutes, special school committee meeting on November 2nd, 2023. B, approval of minutes, regular school committee meeting September 20th, 2023. C, approval of 2023-2024 home education requests. D, request for authorization to accept a proposal and expenditure of funds for fiscal year 24 targeted award from Mass DESE, D-E-S-E, for the mandated new IEP form at $112,584, and for the fiscal year 24 municipal cybersecurity awareness grant, which is free services. E, request for authorization to submit a proposal and expenditure of funds for fiscal year 24 FC, capital FC 344, Homeless Emergency Support Grant for $1,000 per child. And then F, acceptance of human resources notifications, appointments certified point personnel, appointments non-certified, and personal actions, leaves of absences, resignations, and retirements. Can I get a motion to approve the consent agenda A through F? Motion to approve the consent agenda as stated from A through F. Thank Second. you. And um, thank you, Ms. Rivas Mendez, properly seconded by Ms. Sullivan. I'll do a roll call. Ms. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Homer? Yes. Ms. Rivas Mendez? Yes. Mr. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. So that has been approved. Moving on to unfinished business, um, we have a discussion and potential vote uh, on the amendment to Dr. James Cobb's contract, which we discussed on November 28, 2023. Everyone in, you know, on the school committee received a copy of that, and so I would entertain a motion to vote on the amended um, contract for Dr. Cobbs. Motion to uh, approve the amendment of uh, Dr. James Cobbs' uh, contract dated November 28th, 2023. Thank you. Second. Okay, thank you. So, Mr. Rodriguez, properly seconded by Ms. Rivas Mendez. I'll do a roll call. Ms. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Homer? Yes. Ms. Rivas Mendez? Yes. Mr. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. 
So that has approved, so moved. And now under new business, we have a discussion and a potential vote regarding the policy manual subcommittee meeting on November 28, 2023. I know Ms. Azak is not with us tonight. Does somebody want to speak to that? Ms. Yes. Okay. So I will um, read the minutes of November 29, 2023. Thank you. We met um, on this day at the Arnone School Auditorium. Um, we had Ms. Azak present, Mr. Homer, myself, um, and Mrs. Sullivan was absent. Um, the public was able to view this through um, the link. Um, also present was Dr. Kathleen Moran and Miss Marcia Andrande Serpa. Um, Miss Azak invited School Registration and Parent Information Center Director Miss Marcia, who was able to address the policy IBBG and IHBGR homeschooling. Um, she walked through the policy. Um, where she talked about, um, she introduced the process, but she also talked about an online form where parents submit their requests to consider, um, to be considered for homeschooling. Ms. Azak um, was able to go for the full, the full school committee later in December 2023. Um, then we had Dr. Kathleen Moran, who's our Assistant Superintendent of Human Resources, and she spoke about four particular policies, the um, GBGF Family Medical Leave Act, um, where we removed the language concerning COVID-19, GBJC Teachers Personnel File, um, language was changed in the last sentence from will be placed to may be placed, GCIA philosophy of staff development. We added language to item five, um, if funding is available. GBECA criminal offender record um, information. This policy was re was moved to ADDA and ADDR. Ms. Azak wanted to investigate further before approving this item. A motion was made by Mr. Homer and it was properly seconded by Ms. Rivas, Mrs. Rivas Mendes. Um, then Ms. Azak um, read each item from section I instruction and recommended determination for each item advised by the MASC, which is Massachusetts Association of School Committees and Legal Counsel. And the spreadsheet was color coded. Green was MASC policy, orange recommended to move, pink recommended to add, and blue BPS specific. As it was, the only item that came under this discussion was IA instructional goals. This policy was BPS specific, not in mass, and it was the will of this group to recommend keeping it and review the goal annually. Um, a motion was made by Mrs. Rios Mendes, and it was probably seconded by Mr. Homer, and then um, as the time um, was concluded, a motion was made by Mr. Homer, and then properly seconded by Mrs. Rios Mendes, myself. Um, and then there was no further business, um, and the subcommittee adjourned at 7.08 p.m. Thank you. That was a robust report out, Ms. Rivas Mendes. Always. <laughs> That's what I'm known for. Always. <laughs> so I will entertain a motion to approve uh, the policy manual subcommittee meeting meeting minutes. Motion to approve the policy manual subcommittee meeting minutes from November 28, 2023. Thank you, Mr. Second. Homer. Thank you, Ms. Rivas Mendes. So, Mr. Homer first, Ms. Rivas Mendes um, seconded. So I'll do a roll call. Ms. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Homer? Yes. Ms. Rivas Mendez? Yes. Mr. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Excellent. And then, um, oh, the kind of last order of business we have is regarding our Tuesday, December 19th, regular school committee meeting. We need to look at changing the time from 7 p.m. to 6 p.m. in the BHS Little Theater. And so I'll, I don't think, it, does anybody have a, a problem with changing the time? I don't think we do. So I'll entertain a motion to change the time from seven to six. Motion to change the time from seven to six okay, for our you. meeting. Thank you. Second. Okay, excellent. So Ms. Rivas Mendez, seconded by Mr. Homer. Ms. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Homer? Yes. Ms. Rivas Mendez? Yes. Mr. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. <coughs> Mr. Sullivan? Yes. Okay, and I'm a yes as well. Okay, and next we have announcements. Does and we did put announcements at the end to make sure that we could make announcements for anything coming up. Would anybody like to share any announcements? Nobody has any announcements. I have something I want to share. Sure. Um, 
and I hope that we can have an open and transparent conversation amongst the elected members. Um, there was a resolve that was, um, that was filed um, by the city council to invite and quote, it's on the city website, it says interim. Um, Dr. Cobbs is acting superintendent. It's listed as interim, so I think that's an error, if that could be corrected. Uh, school committee, Vice Chair Kathleen Ellers and Mayor Robert Sullivan to appear before the city council, sitting as the finance committee to discuss the Brockton Public Schools, Brockton High School, and recent issues regarding budget and financial governance, audit, staffing, and matters related therein. Invited, Dr. James Cobbs, Kathleen Ellis is the vice chair, and Mayor Robert Sullivan. And the reason why I am bringing this up is that this body was, there was a resolve that was filed that this committee did take the due diligence and showed some respect to show up to the city council to answer some questions. I was in favor of that because we are our elected officials and we do not respond or you know, uh, answer to the city council. Um, that day was an embarrassment to this committee. And what is happening politically is that we have people on the other aisle that is pointing the fingers at this, at this, at this elected body. And at this point, we should not be interjecting with the city council and pointing fingers at each other. They said some things that were uncalled for, unprofessional, and I will say it again and again and again. And I responded to certain individuals. I don't take anything back that I stated. Everything that I stated was actual and true facts. The only thing that I made was a comment about socks. I take that back that I did make that comment. It was unprofessional of myself for saying that, but I was in the moment because I have a lot of passion and love for the city of Brockton and for our students. Um, this, this is what we're discussing and what a resolve that they're asking for us it's all public knowledge. Our meetings are recorded. The city council, as some of us can go back and watch the city council meetings, they can watch this. Nothing is being done in secrecy behind closed doors. They have executive session, we have executive session, so I know they are very educated and not asking any of those questions. It is my opinion only as one of the members here that this body, neither Dr. Cobbs, neither Kathy Ellis, I can't speak for the mayor, to interject or to report to the council to ask any questions. We already voted, we had a discussion, and we have an audit coming uh, forth that we just let it play out. Let the audit happen. Once the audit is complete, it's very transparent. We made it as transparent as can be. The council is gonna know about it. The public is gonna know about it. But there is no other questions that we can answer for them that there is not already public knowledge about. So if a city councilor wants to, to know what's going on, our meetings and our, me and our meetings, I hope they're up to date published, they can ask that. And I respectfully ask that any questions that the councilors do have, they put it in writing. Because if I was to go to the clerk's office and file a resolve to bring those councilors before this body, they are not gonna show up. And I don't think we should interject or anybody because they singled out this whole body and just added the vice chair as Kathy Ellis to go and answer questions. And if there's any qu questions that need to be answered by this collective body, it should be the chair, which is the mayor, Mayor Robert Sullivan, and our legal counsel. So I don't know how anybody else feels. I'm very passionate about this, and I don't want what happened a few months ago to happen again, and we're starting pointing fingers. You know, we all need to fall back and work together. That's what it's all about. We have a problem, let's just fix it. Yeah. None of this trying to you know, pound our chest to say who has more authority. Because when it comes down to law, the school committee has more authority. And I hope everybody's educated enough to know how much authority that this body has. And that's what I always preach. Go to the chart in the course, know your role, ask questions, work with our community, and it's also working with our counselors, but going to file this resolve to go and question us, that's not their job. It is not our responsibility to show up to the council for them to grill us. And I hope this doesn't happen. 
Yeah, and like mentioned, um, our agenda is posted, so they're invited to come anytime upon us to ask any questions. Um, that's usually how it would be done because we're a different gover government um, entity. And any phone calls can be made. I mean, I know a lot of phone calls go to you, Kathy, but I know I was questioned in front of them for accounts review and it was in the fly. And I'll be honest, I felt embarrassed, but I am more than welcome. You can call me. I can answer those questions. And, you know, if I need some time to answer them, please do because it's not a matter of who's doing their job better, but it's a matter of working together for the love of this community and of the city. I also wanna make another announcement. Um, for uh, this Saturday, December 9th, from 10 to 11.30 a.m., the Brockton Main Library Lingos, there's, I'm um, sorry, there's the Right to Read event, which Dr. Haywood talked about in our DREI subcommittee. That event is this Saturday, December 9th, from 10 to 11.30 a.m. It's at the Brockton Main Library Lingles Auditorium. Um, that Brockton Main Library is in Main Street. This is a national event that focuses on literacy and Brockton is one of the few in Massachusetts to have it. I'm also like excited because I think as an educator, a lot of times we don't think about our past of the privilege that we have to be able to read today. Um, and this is, so I know this is an event that talks about the right to read, and I'm pretty sure the right to have the access to have free public libraries. So um, just as an announcement, it'll be this Saturday. That's great. All right, anything else from the body? All right, well, I would en entertain a motion to adjourn. A motion motion to adjourn. second. Okay, well, <laughs> Ms. Sullivan, properly seconded by Ms. Rivas Mendez. I'll do roll call. Ms. Sullivan? Yes. Mr. Homer? Yes. Ms. Rivas Mendez? Yes. Mr. Rodriguez? Yes. Mr. Sullivan? Yes. And I'm a yes as well. Thank you, everybody. Safe travels and have a good night. Okay.